Thank you all for your warm welcome. It's a great privilege to be here tonight to present the Paul Reed Lecture for 2016, especially so as I'm presenting for the first time in my new role as Dean. I had the pleasure of knowing Paul Reed many years ago when I was working on the campus master plan with David Chesterman in the late 80s. Paul was an extremely insightful critic and a, such a pleasure to work with. It made his design critique that much easier to take, I must say. So I'm very glad to have known him and I welcome Wendy here tonight. In thinking about a topic for tonight, it was not too difficult for me to decide to focus on Sydney Harbour. It is arguably Sydney's only truly great public space and perhaps its most contested. Yet it has retained an enduring resilience, beauty and value despite this. The power of social activism, conscious design and continued investment in the public domain have all been instrumental in keeping it that way. But now, more than ever before, the accelerated pace of change and the pressure to become a global city has increasingly resulted in the adoption of international development models and a move to market-led infrastructure provision. This is shifting the focus from public to private, from government to promoter to, as, uh, to government as client, and with mixed results. The future of the harbour is at a critical point, and if we are not to lose what we value most, we need to take stock. So from my professional vantage point, reimagining the harbour city seems a fitting focus for tonight's lecture. To provide some context, first let me expand on my professional background. While early in my career I spent several years in the United States reimagining large urban waterfronts, most of my career has been focused on public projects in and around Sydney. Interestingly, I now realise that over 25 years, I've been instrumental in shaping more places around Sydney Harbour than most. I've primarily worked in the public realm for both city and state governments, as well as the private sector, but most recently in the Government Architect's Office. Inevitably, this work is collaborative and straddles disciplines, and many of my collaborators I can see here tonight. Together, we have developed strategies, plans, and urban projects from Manly to Parramatta. Some the breadth of Sydney Harbour, as in the Sydney Harbour strategy prepared for the Department of Planning in 2015, where we analysed the character of the waterways, the iconic and the everyday places, and developed principles to guide decision-making around the harbour. These principles informed a range of policies, projects, and programmes, many of which I have been involved. Other projects include site-specific master plans around the harbour, such as the transformation of Sydney Olympic Park at Homebush Bay post-2000 from a sports precinct into a mixed-use community complete with new riverfront parklands. We contribute a new layer to these remediated landscapes and curated a range of award-winning park projects like Black Cylinder of Side Park, Newington Armoury and the Brick Pit Ring Walk that lifted the design quality and visitor experience, making a new destinational parkland on the Parramatta River. And then there was Harold Park at Roselle Bay, where we worked with the city to manage competing interests and reconfigure this redundant site into a new, neighbor, new urban neighbourhood converting this to this. And of course, there are other smaller scale interventions within the public domain. Many projects I've worked on have been realized, but just as many remain in the bottom drawer, being too politically fraught at the time, but shelf ready should the political winds change. I've had, diver I've had divergent roles in shaping the public realm, from hands-on design roles to more hands-off but perhaps more influential roles. As a public client conceptualising and commissioning projects, such as the Sydney Spaces project for the City of Sydney leading up to the Olympics, that led to a massive civic improvements program. And I've also contributed as a, contribu as a competition juror. Of note, the Barangaroo International Design Competition, where the stakes were so high, the winning scheme was thwarted. This scheme by Thales, Berkmeyer and Irwin was a compelling urban proposition that responded to the underlying urban condition. 
It was an extension of the city, not just a new address. Here the model of the winning scheme and the reality as it is playing out. Unlike the winning scheme, this reality is distinct and separate from the city in its form, scale, and expression. It imbues an international urban brand more than a distinctive Sydney identity. And there have been many project review roles. Of special note is the Sydney Harbour Design Review Panel established in 1997 under SEP 56 by the then Minister of Planning, Craig Knowles, to lift the design standard of development on strategic sites around the harbour. Chaired by the then government architect, Chris Johnson, and with a lineup of eminent architects, we established and applied consistent design principles that responded to the character of the harbour landscape, ecology and terrain, by scaling new development down to the water so views were still shared, and the waterfront was public and accessible to all. The, the panel contributed to policy development as well, but was above all central to the design development and refinement of many strategic sites around the harbour, and in particular, the Walsh Bay redevelopment. The most successful outcomes from this era occurred when the planning instruments and procurement processes supported these design fundamentals. In Piemont, after effective lobbying by City Council, a place-based urban development plan was prepared by City West Corporation. These place-based controls, in concert with discerning procurement and building better cities funding, delivered for the most part well-designed development and public domains sympathetic with the underlying structure and fabric of the area. New street and block patterns relating to the existing heritage acknowledged, view corridors to the harbour maintained, and the scale of new development responsive to its context. This was in sharp contrast to the parts of the point without this government control and oversight. Adopting a more Vancouver model of waterfront development, taller buildings front the foreshore, effectively privatising it and leaving the smaller scale development behind, visually cut off from the water. In each and every one of these roles, I've gained insights into how the politics play out, why great initiatives never see the light of day, great ideas resurface again and again before the timing is right to be implemented, and sadly, but more frequently, an outcome that is less than ideal wins the day. Nevertheless, lost opportunities provide lessons to do better next time and reinforce the need for constant vigilance. And when things and great things do happen, it's something to be celebrated. As a consequence of this long association with Harbour, I've developed a considerable appreciation and understanding of this unique place, its attributes, its challenges, and its possibilities. There is no doubt the public domain is contested space, and Sydney Harbour, being the jewel in Sydney's crown, is the most contested space in this city. So who is watching out for it? The provocateurs and civic conscious safeguarding the genius loci of Sydney Harbour have often been architects, planners, and conservationists, along, of course, with resident action groups, greenies, and the unions, who have not only challenged the prevailing opinions, but have often proposed alternative ideas and strategies. Not all good, and not all realised, but harbour speculations have been part of our recurring cultural narrative and ensure robust debate. Interestingly, Sulman's vision for the key shares DNA with later ideas of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Many have been achieved with the alignment of successive governments whose commitment to public policy and projects of vision, substance, and design intent have made them happen. As a result, we have a legacy of significant urban projects that have shaped the unique form and identity of our harbour setting. Some iconic, such as the Sydney Harbour Bridge and Sydney Opera House, that elevated our positioning on the global stage. It's hard to imagine our city without them. Other initiatives, though, include discrete policies and projects that have cumulatively resulted in much more than the sum of the parts. Take, for example, our enviable necklace of public foreshore parklands, aggregated over 200 years through various means, including resumption, dedication, and acquisition. A big idea delivered by many hands. 
Recent additions range from the nature reserves and remediated landscapes of Sydney Olympic Park and beyond, to the carefully regenerated defence lands of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, such as Cockatoo Island, pictured here and the more radical but nuanced interpretations of our industrial heritage at Ballast Point, at Piermont Point, and Glebe, to name a few. The latest, of course, is the much debated simulated landscape of Barangaroo Headland Park. The most memorable of these projects are imbued with the palimpsest of the place, each intervention contributing another bespoke layer of experience and meaning. What is clear to me is that the harbour's resilience and beauty is due in no small part to this strategic investment in the public domain by all levels of government, despite often competing political views. But let's take a step back and see how we got here. Without a doubt, Sydney is one of the most extraordinary harbour cities in the world. The city hugs the figural 320 kilometre shoreline of bays and inlets and is ringed with the city's most valued landscapes, cultural icons, infrastructure and development. The early pattern of Sydney's settlement was driven by the geography of this drowned river valley and shaped its distinct form and character of ridgetop roads and street spurs that run down to the water of green headlands and protected bays and anchorages. Despite the city's early focus on the harbour as a place of commerce, transport and industry, we have today this amazing legacy of an accessible and green foreshore. This has been no accident, but rather by design. As early as 40 years after settlement, Governor Darling imposed a 100-foot waterfront reservation on all foreshore grants. However, it was only through the Public Parks Act of 1854 and subsequent amendments in the 1880s that public access to foreshore lands was realised and the waterfront acknowledged for the first time to be of more value than, more, than mere utility, but as a place of recreation. Cremorne Point is but one example of how that 100-foot reservation has been preserved and developed into an enduring and much-loved foreshore parkland. But even with the best of intentions, like all industrial and post-industrial cities, Sydney has had to deal with the tension of competing agendas throughout its history. Economic growth versus environmental protection, public versus private interests, conservation versus renewal. At key moments, these tensions have spawned civic awakening, discourse and demonstration that res resulted in pivotal reimagining around the harbour. For example, Emerge Envir Environmentalists and North Sydney Council were pitted against proposed coal mining interest in the late 19th century and were also instrumental in conserving the Cremorn Peninsula. The public debate, as well as popular commentary across the decades, is testament to the value placed on this extraordinary asset and the deep concern about the alienation of public foreshore land. The anti-privatisation of the foreshores movement strengthened towards the end of the 19th century, and with it, champions such as Niels Nielsen, the then New South Wales Secretary of Lands, who resumed key foreshore sites, notably Nielsen Park and Bradley's Head for Taronga Zoo. This came at a time when the town planning movement was first making its mark with a major focus on open space by providing it and reclaiming it. This chapter in Sydney's early history was a barometer for our future. An imperative to act to challenge the status quo has been born from both threats as well as opportunity. For example, the slum clearance and redevelopment of the rocks at the turn of the 20th century followed the outbreak of plague, but it was as much an imperative to modernise and to drive economic growth at all costs. The government response included a Royal Commission on Sydney Improvement that promoted transformative public works. Rationalisation of harbour management was undertaken through a new Sydney Harbour Trust, and this included the wholesale redevelopment of the deep water berths in Darling Harbour and Walsh Bay, including new streets to act as access the waterfront. Led by Henry Dean Walsh, whose name lives on in the bay that was most transformed by these public works. Fast forward to the 60s boom and the push to redevelop the rocks yet again. 
The inevitable wholesale destruction of the precinct by this mega project spawned resident action and with the support of the Builders Labourers Federation, the first green bands. This grassroots action ensured a different and more layered future for the precinct. And here is the rocks today as testament. Opportunity came in various guises. For example, technological innovations in shipping transformed the working harbour through containerization and later political intervention into a more recreational waterway. And major events, notably the 1988 bicentennial and 2000 Olympics that recalibrated our focus on public life. This was when the pursuit of design quality moved from being a perceived barrier to economic growth to a prerequisite for global competitiveness, international investment, and tourism. I'd like to focus on two key places that were reimagined and transformed once again by these events, Darling Harbour and Circular Quay. Darling Harbour was a flagship urban renewal project of the time, with its iconic maritime influence architecture capturing local and international acclaim. It was an ambitious bid by the then state government to make Sydney an international convention and tourist destination, complete with high design aspirations evidenced by the engagement of notables in Sydney's planning and design community. It was a popular success overall, despite a despite continuing economic difficulties for its festival shopping and IMAX complexes, notably both imported additions to the urban realm. While its failings are rooted in its disconnect from the city and the streets that feed it, as well as its lack of real city uses, it provided an open and egalitarian environment, complete with the maritime museum and aquarium, new cultural draw cards, a waterfront promenade and urban parklands on the west side of the CBD that the city had lacked until then. For 1980s Sydney, it was, for all its flaws, a considerable achievement and brought people to the harbour in droves. Importantly, it set up the framework for future waterfront connections to Piermont to the west and King Street Wharf, Walsh Bay and the Rocks and Circular Quay to the east. This was the first of numerous reimaginings of Darling Harbour that have tried to enhance the connectivity and public realm while meeting commercial demand, each with increasing levels of success. The most successful to date is Darling Quarter, including its hugely popular destinational playground. It reconnects and mediates between the city and the park afresh. It demonstrates the value also of a counter-narrative to influence good urban design. Here we see the 2030 proposition by the city illustrated. The next makeover, still under construction, is the latest retrofit and marks a dramatic shift in scale and density. It remains to be seen how this place of the people will evolve in this new transformation. Circular key. The preeminent interface between city and harbour and the gateway to the city centre was also transformed for the bicentennial. The opening of the Opera House in 1973 was not accompanied by any substantive improvement to its setting. The City Council improved Alfred Street, but the state did nothing with its jurisdiction until goaded into action by an RAIA conference on the future of Sydney Cove around the theme of cities in conflict. Subsequent ideas for the key were broadcast through both an institute competition and a publication, Key Visions, as well as the city's own speculations for Circular Key in Sydney Spaces, a project I curated. The discourse that followed pressured the state to develop its own proposition. These speculations also reveal the complex overlapping jurisdictions which hindered positive interventions in the area and foreshadowed the formation of the Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority in 1998 to integrate planning, development, and management of the Inner Harbour precincts. Recommendations were taken forward by the Government Architects Office with a consortia of high-profile architects as a bicentennial public realm project. Extending around the cove from the Opera House to the Harbour Bridge, and with the retrofit of the train station and overseas passenger terminal, this was a major step in reclaiming the waterfront so that it could be enjoyed by everyone. 
It also included the upgrade of the lower concourse and forecourt to the Opera House, the first major works on the site since its opening in 1973. The completion of East Circular Quay followed and was, of course, not without controversy. A subsequent 1990 redevelopment proposal for East Circular Quay incited damning public and media response. With an 11th hour involvement of Prime Minister Paul Keating, a deal was struck with the City Council to lower the height of the proposed buildings through a transfer of airspace rights between the site and the Council's land. This trade-off guaranteed public access to the private realm via an imposing public colonnade and the completion of this last part of the foreshore promenade. Major design initiatives of the key have been generated at the political level where there has been an imperative to act. So again, the Olympics was a stimulus for change again, with upgrade works to the precinct in the lead up to the two th in 2000 by both city and state. In each case, the Government Architect's Office led the work and battled as best they could through the long-winded process of stakeholder approvals. While improvements can be managed this way, this piecemeal approach does not always result in the best possible outcomes. More recently, in 2010, with an election looming, a more far-reaching attempt to bring this precinct together was commissioned by the then State Government. With my colleagues from the Government Architects Office and Hassel Architects, an ambitious 50-year plan was developed that included removal of the Carl Expressway, undergrounding of the rail line with new buildings above, and 30% more green space with an expanded promenade and new public square on the harbour. With Circular Quay, a focus of Sydney's public life and a place of celebration, reconnecting the city to the harbour and expanding the public realm was the driving in imperative for this vision, turning this into this. This 50-year vision for Circular Quay, Sydney's gateway, was envisaged as a place for people, greener and connected to the harbour. The plan was shelved when the Labour government lost office and brought out later by Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority for the next government. This earlier work was revisited by Schiffer in a more pragmatic way. A number of projects were realigned and delivered in whole and in part, such as the MCA, which was completed, while the associated upgrade works to West Circular Quay and First Fleet Park were truncated, providing only a partial, albeit much needed ramp revamp of this highly pedestrian space. However, missed, however, Missed was the opportunity that the major transport infrastructure and private redevelopment provided to catalyze a holistic strategy for the precinct. With the impetus of over $6 billion worth of investment scheduled around the quay, facilitation and alignment of the complex range of projects were the priorities. But it was clear that with most of the precinct in city and state government control, and with buy-in from private landholders with major developments in the pipeline, this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to deliver a compelling integrated strategy for the precinct. It appeared too good to pass up, but it was. Let's hope the future of Circular Quay is not just a future of irregular upgrade works and cleanups as the carefully considered design concepts laid in, laid in place over the years gradually become worn by the incremental accretions of third-rate retailers and uncooperative authorities. If anything visionary and lasting is to happen at, at the key, there will need to be change in how decisions are made regarding the area. Otherwise, tinkering will continue to be the fate of this magnificent public place. As a final note, the Walsh Bay precinct, hinged between Circular Quay and Barangaroo, and overlaid by the city's cultural ribbon, may hold some potential. A project we conceptualised at the Government Architects in 2012 acknowledged the opportunity of working with multiple strategies and stakeholders to develop a proposal that was much more than the sum of the individual parts. We expanded our brief for an internal fit-out of Pier 2-3 into a vibrant new arts precinct, framing a new water square, an amphitheater, and a green ribbon connecting Dawes Point to the new headland park at Barangaroo. This transformed an arts project into an urban proposition 
with broader benefits to both Sydney siders and the visitor economy. And this was recognised by Infrastructure New South Wales, who have now funded the first stage. It will complete the missing link in the continuous foreshore access from Woolloomooloo to the Bay's precinct, now ripe for redevelopment and pregnant with promise. But that is another chapter to be written. To sum up, we have seen how the drive to become a global city has resulted increasingly in market-led urban paradigms that have shifted the focus from public to private interests, from government as builder to government as client, from locally distinctive to globally ubiquitous urban environments. Witness Marangaroo, an unashamedly international urban brand. But the significance of Sydney Harbour cannot be underestimated to Indigenous Australians, to early immigrants arriving by ship. For Sydney siders and visitors alike, it is one of the places that can and should be enjoyed by all. So let's not rely on predictable paradigms to shape our Sydney. Instead, let's continue to fight for and reimagine the harbour city we want. The challenge is to ensure future development, including the governance and procurement of the last remaining strategic foreshore lands, learns from what exists, including the ecological and cultural palimpsest, and prioritises people and quality in the planning and design of the built environment. So our harbour setting is not only globally competitive and efficient, but inclusive, diverse and resilient. The key to maintaining the harbour's identity is to sustain the unique and particular, the ordinary and the extraordinary, its beauty and delight, all of which make this one of the most livable cities in the world. And that is Sydney's cachet. Thank you. <laughs>